Anubis, with the head of a jackal and the body of a man, is perhaps the most iconic of all the mythical gods. I think the first time I ever really thought about Anubis was when I saw the 1999 movie The Mummy, starring Brendan Fraser. In that movie, the cursed mummy of Imhotep is buried between the feet of an ominous statue of Anubis that rises out of a sand in the ruins of the fictional city Hamanaptra. Then again, in 2001's The Mummy Returns, we see the Scorpion King, played by Dwayne Johnson, making a Faustian pact with the dark god Anubis in exchange for control of his army of jackal-headed demon soldiers. The imagery is dark and foreboding, befitting our almost universal fear of the underworld and the gods and demons associated with it throughout many religions. The underworld is often a place we associate with despair, failure, and doom. But who was Anubis to the real ancient Egyptians? The Egyptian myths are great examples of myths and religion changing over time, with various gods taking on different stories and roles over the course of centuries, or in Egypt's case, millennia. And Anubis might be one of the best examples of that. In a previous episode, titled Gods of Egypt, I went through a version of the Osiris myth that did not really include Anubis except for some side notes about his potentially mixed-up parentage and its possible role in the murder of Osiris. In this episode, I'll retell certain parts of the Osiris myth that involve Anubis in those other versions. You don't need to listen to the Gods of Egypt episode to get something out of this episode, but it might help fill in some of the details. So here we go. Ra, the creator of the universe, created his children Tefnut and Shu, who in time gave birth to Geb and Nut, who then gave birth to the gods Osiris, Set, Isis, and Nephthys. Osiris would take Isis as his wife, and together they would become adored by the humans, and Osiris would ultimately be crowned as king. Set was envious of his brother Osiris, and eager to please her husband, Nephthys set out to give him the encouragement he needed to act on his hatred of Osiris. So Nephthys disguised herself as her twin sister Isis, got Osiris drunk, and tricked Osiris into sleeping with her. What Set discovered was that Osiris had snuck into Nephthys' room drunk and slept with her. Needless to say, he was enraged, and he resolved to kill Osiris. While Osiris slept, Set crept in and measured his body, and then he made an ornate sarcophagus to the exact dimensions of Osiris. Set hosted a party when he finished, and had the sarcophagus on display. He offered the guests the chance to keep the beautiful box if they could fit inside. One by one they tried to claim the box, but only Osiris could fit. And when it was his turn, Set and his accomplices closed the box and shielded it shut. Set declared his revenge for Osiris' betrayal, and hurled the box off to the horizon. Isis then set out to search for the remains of Osiris. But Nephthys would soon discover that she was pregnant, though it was not certain who the father was. The child was named Anubis, and bearing the resemblance to Osiris, was rejected by his mother out of fear of retribution by Set. So she abandoned him in a swamp. Isis found the abandoned boy, took pity on him, and raised him as her own. Anubis would grow up and take on duties in the afterlife shepherding the souls of humans to the right place and weighing their hearts to determine if they deserve eternal life. Isis eventually found the remains of Osiris and returned them to Egypt from a far-off land across the sea. She hid them in the swamp where she first found Anubis and left to prepare to try and resurrect the body of Osiris. While Nephthys was out roaming, she discovered the sarcophagus in the swamp and informed Set. Set, still very much resentful of Osiris, transformed himself into a monstrous beast and went out and ripped the body apart and scattered it across the land. Isis returned to find an empty box and was devastated. Touched by the grief of her sister and questioning her role in all of this, Nephthys came forward to Isis and told her of all that she had done and vowed to help Isis recover Osiris's remains to atone for her crimes. Eventually, they found all but one of the pieces, and thus Osiris could not be fully resurrected. But Anubis arrived and helped them embalm the body, and performed the ritual so that Osiris could live again in the afterlife. Osiris returned, and Isis used her magic to allow for her to conceive a child with Osiris. Osiris then took up the throne in the underworld, where he ruled with his son Anubis as his right hand. While Osiris' younger son, Horus, would compete with his uncle Set for the throne in the living world. The Osiris myth might be the most cinematic of the Egyptian myths and as such, it's easy to see why it was so popular. 
but as I mentioned earlier, there are a handful of variations. This version that features Anubis as a son of Osiris doesn't really seem to appear until the Middle Kingdom of Ancient Egypt, which is about 3,000 years ago. And then it gets more embellished once the Greeks move in during the Ptolemaic period, about 2,300 years ago. But the earliest versions appear in the Old Kingdom of Egypt, which is more like four to 5,000 years ago. And as far as we know, the Old Kingdom is when the pyramids originated, and also where the myths and religion of ancient Egypt were born. And in the Old Kingdom, Anubis' origins are perhaps a bit less dramatic, but actually put him further up the hierarchy than Osiris and Horus. In the Old Kingdom, Anubis was originally a direct son of Ra through the cow goddess Hesat. In this time period, Anubis was responsible for all of the tasks of the underworld and the funeral rituals independent of the Osiris myth. Anubis was one of the original gods of Egypt. Anubis' roles as god of the underworld first consisted of overseeing the embalming process, which preserved the body. Aside from just embalming, this featured the opening of the mouth ceremony, in which spells were performed to symbolically open the eyes and mouth of the dead so that they could see and eat in the afterlife. Additionally, animals were often sacrificed, notably bulls, whose parts were used to symbolize power that was transferred to the dead. And other sacrificed animals may represent enemies of the deceased being defeated. Mourners would be present for this ceremony as well, which might have been something akin to a modern viewing ceremony preceding a burial. Another funeral object, frequently tied to Anubis, is called the Imuit fetish. It's a little different than the kind of fetish you're probably thinking of. It consisted of a stuffed animal skin on a pole, and was an object said to help connect the dead to the living, and they would be made on behalf of a living person, and placed in the burial site of the deceased. The next step for Anubis was guiding the soul from the world of the living to the world of the dead, which was described as a perilous maze full of wrong turns. Anubis is said to have done this personally. On this journey, the deceased would have to pass through the gates of the underworld and profess their innocence and virtue in life before the gods. Once in the underworld, Anubis performed the weighing of the heart ceremony, the most important of the ceremonies. Using his carefully balanced scales, the heart of the deceased, which was believed to contain intellect, emotion, and consciousness, was weighed against the feather of truth, which was taken from the goddess Mat. If your heart was found to be heavy with guilt and sin, it would be devoured by a demon goddess, Amit, and doom the deceased to nothingness. If your heart balanced the scales, however, you were eligible for eternal life. The results were recorded by the god Thoth, and you received a final judgment from Anubis. The final judgment would be a role usurped by Osiris in the later myths. Anubis's final role in this process was as a guardian of the physical tombs and protector of the dead. When you think of the underworld or of judgment, it's generally terrifying, rightfully so. But Anubis was far from the demon-type figure we generally associate with the underworld. Anubis was revered and was even seen as one of the most important deities. His roles in preparing the body for the afterlife and guiding souls to the place of judgment was seen as sacred and immensely serious and benevolent. He is also one of the few gods who is universally important throughout all of Egypt for virtually the entire time that the Egyptian religion was relevant. This benevolence would carry over many centuries later. The Romans, with their heavy Greek influences and a very syncretistic view of religions, would compare him to the god Hermes, who is also seen as a benevolent figure. Hermes was often seen as beneficial to humans, often acting on their behalf before the other Olympians, and frequently traveling between the realm of the gods and man, not so different from Anubis. They would even go so far as to incorporate the two into one deity called Hermanubis, who you can still see statues of today. But despite his beloved status, there doesn't appear to be any independent temples dedicated to Anubis. His appearances are almost entirely tied to tombs, or occasions in which he appears with the other gods as well though there are spots where something along the lines of a shrine to Anubis is thought to have existed. Anubis was immeasurably important to Egyptians and their views of the afterlife. It's fitting that Anubis is depicted as part canine, too, man's best friend. Domesticated dogs were popular in Egypt, and some of the breeds are recognizable as today's greyhounds, whippets, and basenji, and they've been found in tombs as mummies and depicted on the walls. Dogs are strong and loyal, and they can also be fearsome hunters and guardians. Those same traits, of course, being exhibited by Anubis, who aided humans passing between worlds, but also fiercely defended that realm from intruders and people who did not belong. As with any myth, 
It makes me wonder, how did it start, and which came first, the ritual or the myth? As with the rest of Egypt and many other ancient cultures, these kinds of stories and figures most likely existed long before they were written about, the world at the time being much more of an oral tradition place than a written tradition one. One theory about Anubis suggests his imagery is tied to the jackals and wild dogs common around shallow graveyards and animal carcasses, leading to the jackal being associated with the life after death. There is also a hypothesis that this is a large part of why the Egyptians moved towards increasingly robust tombs, because jackals and other scavengers. But at some point, the jackals just became accustomed to the burial areas, despite no longer being able to dig anything up. So going to a tomb at night to steal something may well have meant wandering into the domain of a real pack of predators. And then, much like the evolution of the Osiris myth over thousands of years later, Anubis was perhaps an evolution of this commonly observed theme. And this whole time, I've been using the name Anubis, because it's the most familiar to me and probably the most familiar overall. But his original name in the Old Kingdom was Inpu, which may roughly mean decay, which again fits his role in the association with the dead. And his black face is also symbolic. Black, of course, still to this day being a color associated with seriousness, death, and funerals. But in Egypt, it was also symbolic of fertility and regeneration. The land itself even being called Kemet, or Black Land, referring to the fertile soils left behind by the Nile floods. The concept of regeneration in the afterlife was what made the Egyptian religion tick. From Ra's epic journey across the sky, to preparation for burial by Anubis to ensure that one could see and eat in the afterlife, to protecting the body in a tomb or coffin for eternity. Despite all the pictures of walls covered in hieroglyphs, the reality is that there just isn't a lot of material left behind. Even later Egyptians had forgotten much of what once was, and took the liberty of reframing what they did have. We'll never know the real reasoning for the origin of these myths without a time machine, but me personally, I'm not surprised that a culture with ideas and concepts as grand as Egypt's left behind so much wonder and awe. So there you go. That was Anubis, Egyptian god of the underworld. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to check out the episode description for links to the show on Facebook and Instagram. See you next time. Music in this episode, in order of occurrence, Ibn al-Nur, Desert City, Tabak, and Jalandahar by Kevin McLeod, and available at Incompetech.com. If you like lore and legends, consider supporting the show at buymeacoffee.com slash lore and legends with a one-time gift that will cost less than a cup of coffee. You can also follow on Instagram, where my handle is at loreandlegends1, and on Twitter at loreandlegends3. You can also subscribe to the Lore and Legends YouTube channel, which features video versions of all your favorite episodes. And of course, the official website, loreandlegends.net. Thanks for checking out Lauren Legends. See you next time.